A Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. A Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Explain stuff. Hey everyone, Dr. D here, and in this video, we are going to be covering chapter 11 from our Genetics Essentials textbook, Concepts and Connections, fourth edition. This deals with DNA to proteins, specifically the second part of gene expression, translation, how the protein is made. Key concepts, we're gonna be looking at the ribosome, we're gonna be looking at tRNA and how the, how the ribosome utilizes tRNA, to read the message, the codon specifically on the mRNA, and how that process works from initiation, elongation to, to uh, termination. Now, again, as always, uh, all of these are repeats of 1406 for the most part. Uh, hopefully you learn gene expression and biology 1406. And just like in chapter 10, I had a nice video uh, for transcription. That same video is great for understanding translation. So again, I'll throw that card up above and you can use that all you want to get a good refresher on transcription and translation so that you're back up to speed because a lot of what we learned at Biology 1406 is uh, exactly what you're going to be uh, reminded of here in, in chapter 11. So go ahead and watch that video if you're confused about any part of transcription or translation and it's a great launch pad into this material here so don't forget proteins consist of the building blocks amino acids and there's 20 amino acids 20 common amino acids here are the amino acids alanine arginine asparagine aspartate cysteine glutamate glutamine glycine, histidine, isoleucine, leucine, lysine, methionine, phenylalanine, proline, serine, threonine, tyrosine, tryptophan, and valine. And each one of these amino acids has a three-letter abbreviation and a one-letter abbreviation as well. And these are the building blocks for proteins. Amino acids are the building blocks for proteins. Uh, it's the ribosome's job, and the ribosome, remember from the last chapter, the ribosome is a, a, a ribozyme. Uh, it is an enzyme that is part protein, part RNA, and the ribosome's job is to read the genetic message on the messenger RNA, on the mRNA, and from that message to translate that message into a protein message, into a protein, uh, an amino acid sequence. And that amino acid, that chain of amino acids will form the protein. This is what the amino acids look like uh, on a molecular level. This is an amino acid. Every amino acid has a carbon in the middle. This is known as the alpha carbon. Every amino acid has a carbon in the middle called the alpha carbon. Attached to this alpha carbon are always an amino group, an amino group. Attached to the alpha carbon is always a carboxyl group. Remember your functional groups from Biology 1406. Uh, this is very important that you recall the functional groups from Biology 1406, the amino functional group, carboxyl functional group. By the way, sometimes they could draw the amino group NH2 NH2 without the plus. So you'll see this NH2 plus, uh, sorry, NH2 or NH3 plus. Does that make sense? The carboxyl group can be drawn as COO minus uh, or it could be COOH. Does that make sense? So both of them mean carboxyl group. Don't get confused. Uh, it depends on whether it's the ionized or the non uh, ionized version of the of the uh, uh, functional group. Now, another thing you should know about these uh, amino acids: there is a function, there is a side chain, there is a side chain attached to the alpha carbon as well as a hydrogen. There's always a hydrogen. So, you see um, parts one, two, and three up here. Parts one, two, and three. 
the amino group, the, hy the, the hydrogen and the carboxyl group attached to the alpha carbon. This is called the backbone of the amino acid. This is called the backbone of the amino acid. All amino acids have this same common backbone. All the, all the 20 amino acids have this backbone. The 20 amino acids differ by what's attached to this side chain. R represents the variable group or the variable side chain. And R is the only thing different between the 20 amino acids. So how does the ribosome form proteins from these individual amino acids? Let's say you want to combine this amino acid with this amino acid. The way you link amino acids, and specifically the way the ribosome links amino acids, is that it takes the amino group from one amino acid. You see this? I'm circling the amino group from this amino acid. And it joins it to the carboxyl group. This is the carboxyl group from this amino acid. So you get the amino group of one amino acid attached to the carboxyl group on the next through a process known as dehydration reaction or dehydration synthesis. What does dehydration mean? It means removing water, so this oxygen and these two hydrogens, removing water in order to make a bond. Does that make sense? And that's what the ribosome does. And that leads to an actual covalent bond between what was this carboxyl group and what was this amino group, no longer called those things. But uh, the resultant bond is a covalent bond called the peptide bond. So a peptide bond is the bond between amino acids. It forms via a dehydration reaction uh, facilitated by the ribosome between individual amino acids. By the way, uh, every protein, so this is essentially a protein. A protein is going to be a chain of amino acids. You see this? This is, this is two amino acids. Next, you're going to add another amino acid to the carboxyl end, and then you'll add another amino acid to the carboxyl end. So new amino acids are always added onto the carboxyl end, the carboxyl end of the growing peptide chain. And by the way, every protein, because because amino acids are linked together in this fashion, every protein will have an amino group at one end of the protein, and every protein will have a carboxyl group at the other end of the protein. So every protein has an amino terminus. That means an end with an amino group, uh, also known as the N terminus for the nitrogen in the amino uh, functional group. And every protein has what's known as the carboxyl terminus, or C terminus for the carbon in the carboxyl group. Does that make sense? Every protein is a chain of amino acids. Every protein has an amino group at one end and a carboxyl group at the other. Concept check number one. What determines the secondary and tertiary structures of a protein? Do you recall this from biology uh, 1406? Uh, if you don't recall this, I will go ahead and throw up another card. Okay, here's a card. And this card is about the structure of proteins and how proteins are formed how and how the secondary structures form, primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary structure of, of uh, proteins. If you don't remember this, this was from a different chapter in biology, uh, 1406. I'm going to throw that card up. Please review that. But it's the, uh, the side chains that dictate. It's the, actually, more importantly, uh, it's the amino acid sequence that dictates the structure of the proteins. You know why? Because it's the backbone of those amino acids that dictates the secondary structure. And it's the side chains of those amino acids that dictates the tertiary structure. You don't really need to know that, but it's important to know that it's the amino acid sequence, the primary structure essentially, that dictates the overall folding and structure of the protein. So here you have the primary structure. Essentially, that's the list of amino acids in order. That amino acid sequence results in 
secondary structures. Do you recall the two forms of secondary structure there are, the two most common secondary structure? There's the alpha helix, which is depicted here, but there's also flat areas called beta sheets. Remember, proteins are, uh, proteins possess the secondary structures, alpha helices and beta sheets. Those alpha helices and beta sheets come together because of the side chain interactions to form the tertiary structure of the protein, uh, otherwise known as the properly folded protein. Remember from Biology 1406 that proteins need to be folded correctly in order to function correctly. Does that make sense? And that's called the tertiary structure of the protein. Now, most proteins, you're done at the tertiary structure level because the protein's finished translating, it's folded, it does its job. However, some proteins can't function alone. They, they function with other, uh, other, other proteins in a multimer. And when that happens, that's called the quaternary structure. So for example, if this is hemoglobin protein or hemoglobin beta, it's going to function with other hemoglobin proteins in order to do its job. Does that make sense? So not all proteins have a quaternary structure, only proteins that need other uh, proteins uh, working in concert to do their job have a quaternary structure. Most proteins, you're done at the tertiary structure stage. So how does the process of translation work? The process by which your cells interpret the genetic message from the mRNA and use it to produce the correct amino acid sequence it, to form a protein, a correct protein. Well, it all has to do with this genetic code, which, which relies on codons or triplet codes from the DNA uh, that are copied into RNA. There's 64 possible triplet codes of DNA. Three of them uh, code for stop codons uh, and not for amino acids. 61 of them code for amino acids, code for amino acids. So what is a codon? What is a codon? Let's do concept check number two. Codon is one of the three nucleotides that includes an amino acid. One of three nuclei, that doesn't make any sense. Three nucleotides that encode an amino acid, that makes sense. Three amino acids that encode a nucleotide, doesn't make sense. One of four, but no, I, I believe it's B, B. A codon is a triplet code, three nucleotide code that codes for a particular amino acid. Now, uh, there's some things to understand about the genetic code. One thing you should understand is that the genetic code is degenerate. The, ge the, the genetic code is degenerate. More than one codon, triplet code, uh, remember how many codons are there? 64 possible codons, 61 of which code for amino acids. Um, think about it real quick. How many amino acids did I tell you there were uh, earlier? Remember that table of, uh, of uh, uh, amino acids we covered just at the beginning of this video? There were 20 amino acids, correct? If there are 20 amino acids, but 61 codons that code for amino acids, could you see the problem there? What that means is more than one of these codons probably code for the same thing, right? So there's more than one codon that codes for uh, valine, for instance. Uh, and there's more than one codon that codes for histidine. So the genetic code is degenerate. Amino acid may be specified by more than one codon. It makes sense. I mean, there's 61 uh, codons that code for amino acids, but there's only 20 amino acids. Obviously, more than one codon has to code for an individual uh, type of uh, uh, amino acid. Synonymous codons, codons that specify the same amino acid, also known as redundant codons. That, so again, you have more than one codon that codes for the same thing. These are called synonymous or redundant codons. 
iso accepting trnas different trnas that accept the same amino acid but have different anticodons we're going to get into this but it makes sense if you're going to have different codes different codons for the same amino acid you're also going to have different trna with the same amino acid now don't forget you have the the codons you have a start codon. The start codon, also known as the initiation codon, is AUG. This this is the start codon, and it is the codon that codes for the amino acid methionine. Does that make sense? So the start codon not only does it start translation, but it also codes for an amino acid called methionine. But the termination codon or stop codon, these stop codons, UAA, UAG, and UGA, these stop codons only direct the translation process to stop. There is no amino acid that they also code for. Does that make sense? So the terminating codons, and by the way, any one of these three codons will direct uh, translation to stop if it's in frame right on during the process of translation AUG the first AUG in the mRNA at the five prime end of the a a mRNA the first AUG will will direct uh, a start to translation and the first stop codon in frame will direct a stop to translation next we're going to be touching on a wobble hypothesis concept as well the wobble position of a codon is the third position of the codon. So we're going to talk about the wobble position in more detail. So here's the codon table. Here's the codon table. The table works like this. Uh, the first base of the codon is, is uh, dictated, uh, uh, depicted here on the left. The second base is depicted here on the top. And the third base is depicted on the right. So notice that if you have U's, A's, G's, and C's, there are only 64 possible three-letter words you can make. And the codon table here is every possible three-letter word, right? It's every possible codon. And do you remember how many codons there are? That's right, it's 64. There's 64 codons on this table. It's every possible codon you could have with A's, G's, C's, and U's, right? How many of them are stop codons? Three, right? So it's three of the 64 you see here I'm highlighting. Three of the 64 are stop codons. They don't actually code for any kind of amino acid. They just say stop translating, you're done making a protein, right? They, they direct the ribosome to dissociate. They direct the ribosome to stop making protein. Now what's this? AUG, why is that in green? Remember, AUG is not only the start codon, but it also the codon for an amino acid, methionine. By the way, you can have more than one AUG in a, in a mRNA. You can have more than one AUG. It's just the very first one will direct the, um, the ribosome to begin translation. Any subsequent AUG will simply direct the uh, ribosome to put methionine amino acid in place. And again, please watch my video I told you about earlier about translation. If you forgot how translation works, my Biology 1406 uh, lecture breaks it down into very simple terms if you want to go back and watch that. And again, look at this. Why do you think there are, look, why do you think on the on this table CCU, the codon CCU codes for proline, CCC codes for proline, CCA codes for proline, CCG codes for proline. Why do you think all of these code for the same amino acid, proline? What's the answer to that question? The answer is because of the degeneracy of the genetic code, right? You can have more than one codon code for the same amino acid. Remember I told you uh, why are there 64 different codons and only 20 different amino acids? Well, this is why. The amino acids, uh, the genetic code is degenerate.
there is a lot of redundancy, right? So you can see here, uh, and say similar, look here, similarly, C-U-U, C-U-C, C-U-A, C-U-G, all code for leucine. And isn't that interesting? Okay. Um, now, another thing about the genetic code is that it's, although it's redundant or degenerate, it's not ambiguous. What does that mean? CCC only codes for proline. It will not code for anything other than proline. Does that make sense? There's no ambiguity here. CCC codes for proline, period. It's not going to code for leucine. It's not going to code for anything else. So although the genetic code is degenerate, it is not ambiguous, right? Also, do you notice what's the difference between CCU, CCC, CCA, CCG? What's the difference there? What's the difference? It's the third letter, isn't it? The third letter? That's called the wobble position. Wobble position. Remember the wobble hypothesis? There's least strict binding between the tRNA and the wobble position on the mRNA. You see, this would be the third position of the codon. That, that binds to the third position on the tRNA. Well, that's the least stringent binding with the least amount of fidelity. So uh, because of that, the same tRNA, the same tRNA might be able to bind to all of these codons, right? Does that make sense? Imagine if the imagine if there was a tRNA that had the anti-codon G G G. Look here, G G G. Wouldn't that tRNA bind to this codon C C C? Yes. But that same one might bind to CCU, CCA, CCG, and you might be like, why? Why is why is GGG binding to um, CCU? Why is it binding to CCA? GGG should bind to CCC. Well, because the wobble position, the third position, is is a weird. Um, it's it, it's 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 a, a kicked up at an angle, and there isn't very good binding between that third position. So, this a, a fewer number of tRNA can read a larger number of these codons. Isn't that interesting? So here's the wobble uh, hypothesis again. You see, look at this codon. The codon is UCC, correct? The codon is UCC, which codes for the amino acid serine. The amino acid serine. Look, UCC. Where is UCC? UCC. UCC, the codon UCC, codes for the amino acid serine. UCC recruits the tRNA with that's attached to the amino acid serine, remember at its three prime end. This tRNA obviously has the anti-codon for UCC, which is AGG. Okay, makes sense? If the mRNA says UCC, the tRNA is going to say AGG. But guess what? Later on, there might be a code on UCU, but the same exact tRNA that bound here to UCC, it, it could bind to UCU. The one with AGG and the anticodon might bind to UCU, and you might say, that shouldn't bind. AGG should not bind to UCU. It doesn't make any sense. Well, it does make sense if you factor in the wobble position, and that's because pairing at the third codon, aka the wobble position, is relaxed. It's not great. So because of this, you don't need 61 different tRNA, all with these different anti-codon to, to attach to the 61 different codon. You can have one tRNA, and it might bind to four different codon. Does that make sense? Even though that doesn't make any logical sense, it does if you factor in the wobble effect. So. Hopefully you understand wobble. Let's test your understanding of wobble and test your might, right? Through wobble, a single what can pair with more than one what? Let's look there. A single codon can pair with more than one anticodon? Nope. A single group of three nucleotides in DNA can bind to more than one codon in mRNA? Nope. A single tRNA can bind to more than one amino acid. Uh, you might think this is correct, but the amino acid part's not correct. A single anticodon, a single anticodon, which is part of the tRNA, 
can bind to more than one codon. Yes, it's D. Does that make sense? Awesome. Let's keep going. More things to factor in during translation. Do you remember reading frame? Reading frame is very important, and it's dictated by the first start codon in the mRNA. Remember, wherever that AUG is on the mRNA, that's the start codon, and that's going to dictate the reading frame. The reading frame is every three uh, uh, nucleotides, every three letters from that point. That's your reading frame. You could shift your reading frame, but that's called a frame shift, right? That, that could be caused by mutations. All right, so reading frame. Three ways in which the sequence can be read in groups of three. Each different way of reading encodes a different amino acid sequence. Non-overlapping. A single nucleotide may not be included more than one codon. Remember this? I told you that the, the, the genetic code is not ambiguous. The AUG will only code for methionine. It will never code for a different amino acid. That's what this non-overlapping idea is. And what, one thing you should know about the genetic code as well is that it's practically universal. It's practically universal. What does that mean? That means AUG means start and methionine in you. AUG means methionine in me. AUG means methionine in a fruit fly. AUG means methionine in an E. coli cell. AUG means methionine for a virus, okay? AUG means methionine, period. It's universal. This is why we can take the human insulin gene and stick it in E. coli, and E. coli grows and grows and makes insulin for you, right? Does that make sense? E. coli has no business making insulin, but you give it the insulin gene, it knows how to read the codons the right way, just like we do, and makes the correct protein, right? That would not be possible if the genetic code were not universal. All right, let's move on. So the binding of tRNAs, how does that work? Initiation of translation, elongation of translation, termination of translation. Again, watch my video on translation. If, if any of this is not, you know, clicking, but here's your mRNA. Remember we discussed in chapter 10, mature mRNA, right? You've got the five prime end of the mRNA, the three prime end of the mRNA. Now, the ribosome will attach somewhere near the five prime end of the mRNA because that's where translation begins. And it's not gonna translate all of the mRNA into protein, is it? Remember, there's a five prime untranslated region, also known as the five prime UTR the ribosome will find the first AUG start codon and, and it, it will start translating there. And then the ribosome will progress towards the three prime end and it will make an amino acid. Every three, every three, codon, uh, every three uh, nucleotides serves as a codon. Every three nucleotides will serve as one of these amino acids on the growing peptide chain during this process of translation, the polypeptide chain is formed with the amino group sticking out this end. And remember, each subsequent amino acid is attached to the carboxyl group of the previous amino acid. And so you're, you're building the polypeptide chain from the N terminus to its C terminus. And then you will stop somewhere when, wherever the, the stop codon is. But that doesn't mean at the end of the uh, mRNA because there's a three prime untranslated region as well. So here's your start codon. Somewhere around here will be your stop codon and the ends are not translated. And all of this depends on amino acyl tRNA um, synthetase. These are enzymes that charge the tRNA with amino acids. So tRNA are essentially those clover-shaped RNA that we talked about in chapter 10. Remember tRNA? But you need to charge the tRNA with an amino acid. You have to attach an amino acid. The, the, the amino acid that corresponds to its anticodon loop, you have to charge that tRNA with an amino acid, uh, and that's a charged tRNA. The job of that, uh, the, 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 the enzyme that's tasked with doing that charging of the tRNA is called aminoacyl tRNA synthetase, 
And these are the enzymes that charge the tRNA. And it's not just willy-nilly with any uh, amino acid. A specific amino acid is charged up on the tRNA. So there are exactly 20 different amino acyl tRNA synthetases in the cell, one for each different amino acid. Concept check number four. Amino acids pair, uh, bind to which part of the tRNA? The anticodon part of the tRNA? No, that's the part of the tRNA that binds to the, to the codons. The DHU arm? No, that's part of its cloverleaf st structure. The three prime end? Yes. The five prime end? No. Three prime end. Awesome, let's keep going. Initiation of translation. How does translation begin? Well, there's an initiation factor, IF3, binds to small uh, ribosomal subunit, the small ribosomal subunit, preventing the large subunit from binding dur during initiation. So you don't want the large subunit to bind until initiation is complete. Um, there is the initiator tRNA. This is your methionine carrier. Uh, remember, because the first amino acid is methionine. So the initiator tRNA with N-formal methionine attached to uh, form FMET tRNA binds to the small subunit uh, uh, of the ribosome. So FMET tRNA is the tRNA that brings methionine, the first methionine, to the small subunit of the ribosome. In initiation factor three prevented the large hamburger bun, right, the large subunit of the ribosome from attaching. And the, and the energy to, pr to do translation is facilitated by GTP. Much like ATP in the cell is energy molecule, GTP in the cell is an energy molecule. So here's the structure of tRNA. See, you've got tRNA, which is essentially a piece of RNA that's folded in on itself into this clover leaf structure. Uh, I call it an inverted L shape, right? Because it looks like an inverted L here in this cartoon but it technically has a clover leaf shape. The tRNA has a five prime end, and if you follow it to its three prime end, you know, it kind of folds back in on itself with, with complementary base pairing. Here's the anticodon end of the tRNA, you know, the part that binds to the codons on the mRNA. Here's the three prime end. The three prime end is the acceptor stem for the amino acids. That's where the amino acids get loaded onto the tRNA. So a tRNA without an amino acid attached is called the uncharged tRNA. And once the amino acyl synthetase enzymes add the amino acids to the three prime end of the tRNA, that's called a charged tRNA, right? That's a charged tRNA. Just like in my 1406 video that I've been uh, suggesting for you, just like in the 1406 video, what I, what I explained, the tRNA are essentially printer cartridges, printer cartridges. Charged tRNA are like ink, right? Like ink for your printer cartridge. So what's the printer then? If, if tRNA are like ink for your printer cartridge for making proteins, what's the printer? The printer is ribosomes. Does that make sense? The ribosome is like a printer. It's a 3D printer of proteins. But printers are useless without ink cartridges. tRNA are utilized as the ink cartridges for the 3D printer, the ribosome. So the ribosomes use mRNA as the instructions for 3D printing a protein. And it's those ink cartridges that are the tRNA, right? Again, if any of this is gibberish, if any of this doesn't make sense, please watch my 1406 video on, on, um, on translation and transcription because it make it much more clear. So during initiation of translation, in prokaryotes, we've got the shine Dalgarno sequences, and in eukaryotes, we've got the Kozak sequence. These are the sequences that allow initiation of translation to begin, right? So what we want to know is that shine dalgarno sequence, consensus sequence in bacteria, Kozak sequence in eukaryotes. 
So here we're seeing a bacteria cell because we've got the shined Algarno sequence and the 50S and 30S subunits of the ribosome. So you've got your small hamburger bun, the small subunit of the ribosome, 30S. And then you've got your uh, initiation factor 3, which binds and prevents the large hamburger bun, the 50S subunit, from attaching. Next, the small hamburger bun, the, sm the, the 30S subunit of the ribosome, finds the initial codon, the start codon AUG. And remember, that doesn't mean the beginning of the mRNA because there's an untranslated 5' prime region of mRNA. It finds the first AUG, which is the start codon. Next, with the help of GTP and uh, initiation factor 1 and 2, you have binding of the first tRNA printer cartridge, right? The, the charged up tRNA carrying methionine, FMET. The start codon reads AUG, so it's no wonder that the tRNA with the anticodon UAC, the anticodons UAC on the anticodon loop of this tRNA binds, okay, and that allows binding of the codon to the stop codon, okay, and then you have release of the uh, initiation factors 1, 2, and 3 allowing the large hamburger bun, <laughs> the large subunit, to bind. And now you have initiated translation. This is initiation of translation. So what have you done? AUG is in the P site. Hopefully that's review, but I'll, I'll explain that in a minute. This is called the P site of the ribosome. This is the E site. And on the right, you have the A site. AUG is in the P site of the ribosome. The tRNA uh, anticodon for AUG, which reads UAC, is attached. That tRNA is attached to the um, methionine amino acid at its 3' prime end. And you're ready to begin translation, right? So the next, the next amino acid, or the next codon reads UGC. The next codon reads UGC. So which tRNA should come in and bind here at the A site? Which tRNA should come and bind to UGC? Huh? UGC. Well, it's the one with the anticodon, ACG, right? And what does this codon read? UGC. So let's look. Look at our table. UGC. Let's go back to our table real quick. UGC. Where's our table? I skipped our table. Here, where's UGC? UGC codes for cysteine. Cysteine, right? Cysteine. So, let's see. So you know what? The tRNA with the anticodon ACG will come in here and attach, and it will bring with it the amino acid cysteine. Does that make sense? Uh, and that's how translation begins. That's how you get the first two amino acids in the right place. Do you see now why I call the ribosome a printer and why I call the tRNA the printer cartridge? Without these little cartridges bringing the amino acids, to the ribosome and the mRNA and pairing it up with the correct codon on the mRNA, a protein is not going to be 3D printed. It's not going to be formed, right? All right, one more thing, and that is figure 11.10 tells you that the poly A tail of the eukary eukaryotic mRNA plays a role in initiation of translation. Why? Because that poly A tail, remember 50 to 250 ACE, can actually fold forward and interact with proteins called poly A proteins, and that can interact with transcription factors, these cap binding proteins, to enhance the binding of the ribosome to the 5' end of the mRNA and to get translation started. Isn't that interesting? So to get, to get the ribosome in place, and to get this initiation going, the poly A tail plays a role. So let's do concept check number five, and then take a quick little break time with Gizmo and Wicket, and we'll come back strong to finish this chapter. What do you say? Let's do that. So 
Concept check number five. During the initiation of translation of bacteria, the small ribosomal subunit binds to which consensus sequence? Hmm. Remember, that was the Shine Delgado. Yeah, the Delgarno sequence. Uh, remember, because it's the Kozak sequence in eukaryotes, right? So let's go ahead and take a quick break time with Gizmo and Wicket. We'll come back strong, finish this chapter. What do you say? Hey everyone, welcome back from break time with Gizmo and Wicket. Let's continue on with our discussion of translation. So recall that the ribosome has three cavities inside, three spots where the tRNA can exist. There is the E site for exit. That's where the uncharged tRNA exit the ribosome. There's the P site where the peptide bond is formed. That That is the enzymatic portion of the ribosome. That's where the enzyme activity occurs. The ribosome has what's known as peptidyl transferase activity. So <clears throat> it is able to make the peptide bonds between adjacent amino acids. The peptide bonds are formed in the P site of the uh, ribosome, and that is through the activity peptidyl transferase. Then the A site, also known as the amino acyl or accepting site, that's where the tRNA, the charged tRNA, are accepted. So fresh printer cartridge comes in at the A site. The P site then transfers the growing peptide chain to that uh, incoming amino acid in the A site through peptidyl transferase activity, forming a peptide bond. Uh, and the uncharged tRNA exit the E site. Again, if you don't recall this, how this process works, please check out my video from 1406. It breaks it down step by step by step. But essentially, each time uh, elongation cycle occurs, a new tRNA comes in, a spent tRNA ejects, and the, and the peptide bond is increased by one amino acid. And this includes uh, help from the elongation factors. These are proteins that help out with the process the elongation factors T, U, T, S, and G, and with the help of GTP as well. So let's see what happens during this elongation process. And here's a nice uh, YouTube video. If you want to check out this YouTube video, it's a great animation of this process, really breaks it down, and I really recommend you watch this video. It's not my video, but it's one that I highly recommend. So here you can see the uh, initiation of translation has begun, and the next uh, codon reads CCC in the accepting site. So the tRNA with the anticodon GGG, along with help from the elongation factor TU and GTP, binds to the A site. And then remember the P site in the ribosome has peptidotransferase activity. So essentially what's going to happen is this methionine is going to be transferred. It's going to be cleaved off of this tRNA in the P site. Then the methionine is going to move over to the A site. Methionine will uh, form a peptide bond between, between itself and glycine, the incoming amino acid glycine. So what you end up with is methionine attached to glycine. Now you have a dipeptide. Do you see that? A dipeptide. You've started making a protein. This is, you're starting making the polypeptide. And the tRNA that was in the A site is now called uncharged tRNA. This tRNA no longer has an associated amino acid. This tRNA in the A site has two associated amino acids now, a dipeptide. So what happens at this point? The ribosome shifts one codon to the right. The ribosome moves one codon to the right. So the AUG codon moves to the E site. The CCC or glycine codon moves to the P site. And this ACG codon moves to the A site. At that point, what happens? Well, the uncharged tRNA exits the E site a new tRNA matching the codon ACG is recruited to the A site, 
and the process repeats itself. This is called elongation. And this happens over and over again. Each time it happens, you increase the peptide chain by one amino acid until you encounter a stop codon in reading frame. So let's see here. You continue on. The, uh, again, the uncharged tRNA is ejected, freeing up a spot for new tRNA, the next charged tRNA, to be accepted in the A site. And you conclude again. So the conclusion here is at the end of each cycle of elongation, the amino acid that was in the A site is added to the polypeptide chain and the A site is free to accept another tRNA. So concept check number six. In elongation, the creation of peptide bonds between amino acids is catalyzed by what? Is it the rRNA? Is it the tRNA? Is it the protein in the small subunit? Is it the protein in the large subunit? Well, it's the rRNA. The rRNA in the large subunit catalyzes the reaction. It catalyzes that peptidyl transferase activity forming the peptide bonds, those covalent bonds between the amino acids. So then we have termination, right? At some point after elongation has gone on for a while, you're going to end, end up encountering a stop codon, either UAA, UAG, or UGA. Any one of these work as stop codons. And at this point, these stop codons Remember, they don't code for a amino acid, and there is no tRNA that recognizes these stop codons. Instead, a protein recognizes these stop codons. That protein is called release factor. When that protein binds, it causes dissociation, release of the mRNA in the ribosome to terminate translation. So let's look here. Here's your polypeptide chain, so you can tell Elongation has been going on for quite a while, and now suddenly in the A site appears a stop codon. In this case, it's UAG, the stop codon UAG. Now that recruits not a tRNA, but a release factor, which is a protein release factor. So release factor attaches. Another release factor forms a complex with GTP to the ribosome, and this causes dissociation, dissociation and end, it releases the polypeptide to end translation. So again, you have uh, this process over again. You have charging of individual tRNA by uh, uh, amino acyl synthetase. You have the start codon, the small subunit binds along with IF3 and the start FMET tRNA, the large subunit binds the after the, the start tRNA binds, right? This is initiation of translation. Then you have elongation where charged tRNA enter the A site, uncharged tRNA exit the E site, and peptidyl transferase activity, aka peptide bond formation, occurs in the P site. Eventually, you encounter a stop codon, in which case release factor binds, dissociation occurs and the peptide is released. And remember, this peptide, this completed polypeptide, well then, uh, it, it forms the secondary structures, those alpha helices and beta sheets. Those then fold in on themselves to form tertiary structures, and the protein is complete. The protein has been made. So the conclusion here is, through the process of translation, amino acids are linked in the order specified by the mRNA. So it was the mRNA that told the ribosome where to start translation, it was the mRNA that told the ribosome which uh, amino acid to put adjacent to which amino acid by recruiting which tRNAs with which correct anticodons. And it was the mRNA that dictated the final amino acid in the protein as well to, to stop translation, to cease translation. So, and where did this mRNA message come from originally? This mRNA message came from DNA. It was a complement copy of the template strand of DNA, if you recall during transcription. So you could see that it is your genes that code for the mRNA. That very mRNA with the codons, 
the codon message that's interpreted by the printer, the, the ribosome, and those tRNA in order to string together the correct, uh, the correct sequence of amino acids in order to have the correct protein form and fold, and that protein needs to fold correctly based on its side chains, right, side chain residues, and that protein will have a job, right? So again, here's a table summarizing everything. And here's a concept you should be aware of, and that's polyribosomes. An mRNA with several ribosomes can be attached. So you could have one mRNA with many ribosomes. This can occur in both prokaryotes and eukaryotes. But remember, very importantly, uh, transcription and translation can occur at the same time only in prokaryotes, not in eukaryotes. However, individual mRNA can form polyribosomes uh, in both prokaryotes and eukaryotes. So in prokaryotes, that's what I said, transcription and translation can occur simultaneously. In eukaryotes, transcription occurs first, followed by pre-mRNA pre processing. Remember the five prime cap, three prime poly A tail, and the splicing out of the introns, followed by translation. So what is a polyribosome? You see here, you have one mRNA, one mRNA, and you can have multiple ribosomes attached at different parts at different phases of translation, at different uh, uh, um, progression points, uh, if you will, of translation. So you see here the, uh, the direction of translation in this electron micrograph. Uh, you're transcribing from right to left. So you can see here the polyribosomes are shorter on the right than at the left because as you copy the mRNA becomes longer and longer and longer, right? So this allows you, what do polyribosomes allow you to do? It allows you to copy um, the mRNA the fastest. You, why should you wait, think about this, why should you wait for a, for a ribosome to completely read all the way through the mRNA before another ribosome can attach and read? Why not have one, um, you know, why, why not have one ribosome attach and copy and as it moves, immediately have another ribosome attach and copy. And then as that moves out of the way, immediately have another ribosome attach and copy. You see, that's how you could end up with multiple ribosomes on a single mRNA. This allows you to get more uh, the fastest protein response. Your, your cells want as much protein from that mRNA as possible before that mRNA degrades, right? Because remember, mRNA will degrade over time. So, final concept check. In a polyribosome, the polypeptides associated with which ribosomes will be the longest? Okay, the, the ribosomes at the five prime end? No, that's where translation begins. So why would the polypeptides be longest where transcription begins? Those at the three prime end, yes, because the three prime end is where transcription ends. Does that make sense? So by the time the ribosome is at the three prime end on the mRNA, close to the untranslated region, you know, where the, uh, where the stop codon is, that's where the polypeptide will be the longest because it'll be almost done or done. Okay, so that wraps up this chapter. I hope it made a lot of sense. If not, again, for the nth number of time, go back and review that chapter from 1406. I think it'll uh, do you good if you're confused at all. I hope this all makes sense. Let me know in the comment box below if you have any questions, and I'll catch you guys next time. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. A Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. A Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. A Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D.